morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you today. My name is Natanya Friesen, and I'm going to be one of your co-hosts this morning. I'm a member at All Saints Kingsway Anglican Church, a longtime resident of the Kingsway, and a mom to three kids who range in age from 10 up to 18. And uh, I have found, as I'm sure you have, that parenting in the midst of COVID presents a really unique set of challenges. And so I'm excited to be here today. I'm looking forward to our time together uh, and especially to hear what Dr. Tessimer has to say. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Reverend Brian Suggs, who's gonna get us started. Thanks, Natanya. Hi, Dr. Tessimer. Hello, moms of the Kingsway, moms of Sunny Lee and surrounding areas. We're really so glad you're here today. My name is Brian. I'm one of the priests, pastors here at All Saints Kingsway. I'm also a husband and father of three beautiful girls who range from teenager to toddler, a, a wonderful challenge <laughs> that I'm really grateful for. Friends, some of you have asked and some may be wondering how did the Kingsway talks come to be? The short story is that in the spring of 2019, All Saints undertook a neighborhood needs assessment. We wanted to know what needs were present in our neighborhood and then we wanted to look at ways that we could respond to those needs. In the course of that assessment, Patrick, the other priest and pastor here at All Saints, who's running the tech end of things this morning, thank you, Patrick, we met with Dr. Tessimer. And she told us about some needs that she saw present in the patients at her practice. And one of those was a need for support for mothers in the neighborhood and especially young mothers. We heard from others who helped identify other needs like addiction, although largely hidden in our neighborhood, it is present, and the need for support for caregivers of dementia and Alzheimer's patients. We had other ideas of ways to respond, but just as we were getting ready to begin, COVID happened and well, you, you know the rest, right? Everything changed and we had to put our plans on hold. In December, we met again with Dr. Tessimer, but this time on Zoom, appropriately enough, to talk about the idea of hosting a webinar on these topics, a way to at least begin these important conversations. Our hope is that this time together this morning is helpful and that you can get answers to some of your questions, that you'll be encouraged to know you're not alone in your struggle, in your stress, in your fear, in your anxiety. There are other moms experiencing, experiencing it too. Dr. Tesmer is gonna speak about some local options for support and I encourage you to use those as you need them. If you're looking for help spiritually, we and other local churches in the Kingsway are here for that. Send us an email, connect on Instagram or Facebook. We're here to help and support you. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can do so anonymously if you choose. And at the end of Dr. Tesmer's presentation, Natanya and I will uh, take your questions to Dr. Tesmer and give her a chance to respond. Also at the end of the session, there'll be a quick three question poll come up on your screen. Give us your feedback and let us know what you think. Feel free to reach out after the session if you have further thoughts. And last, the webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel later today. An email will come to you tomorrow with the link. Dr. Tessimer, thank you so much for being here today. We're delighted to have you. We're gonna turn things over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've locked myself up in the home office, but there may be interruptions. I already heard the <laughs> printer going off, children yelling. So uh, I'm sure everybody can relate. Um, now, can I have slides up or do I need to, uh, can we get the slides up for me? I will do that for you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. So, We'll start off with, so today's talk is about COVID and motherhood. And um, as Brian has said, it's a collaboration between Prince Edward Medical, where I work, and All Saints uh, uh, Kingsway. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you an outline. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction about myself. We're going to talk about COVID and mental health, COVID and mothers, what we're seeing in family practice um, in the community, some resources, and then we'll go through some question and answers. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so I think Brian gave the gist of it. Um, so thank you so much for inviting us. I think it's so great. Um, what I didn't realize and I learned from talking uh, with Brian and Patrick is that the uh, resources of the church are open to everybody. So it's not just church members, so it's to the community. So I encourage you to um, uh, share with your people that you know uh, for any of the talks to uh, join. Um, so the idea was to identify areas that we, we both identified as in need. So. I'm doing the COVID and motherhood uh, today. The addictions is gonna be done by my colleague, Dr. Anna Holland, and then the um, caregivers for dementia and Alzheimer's will be done by my colleague, uh, Haley McInnes, both excellent speakers. So I encourage you to, uh, to block off that time if you're able to participate. So my name is Dr. Sandy Tessimer and I'm a family physician in the community. I practice cradle to grave uh, general practice. So that means that my youngest patients come right out of the womb and I take care of them at the hospital. My oldest ones are over a hundred years old and most of those ones I tend to take care of at home. And I also do low risk obstetrics, which means I take care of pregnant patients, deliver them, and then I see mom and baby in the office afterwards. So it really gives me a nice bird's eye view of what's happening not just individually, but as a family, because as we know, something that affects one person in uh, an illness or a stress or whatever it is can affect the whole family. So I have the opportunity um, and the privilege to be able to see that. Next slide. Okay, so I'm getting over a little bit of statistics. So COVID and mental health. Um, the COVID pandemic was new to everybody, uh, especially early on, started in late December in Wuhan, uh, China. And then we heard news reports, but it really became a big issue for us uh, late February, early March when the mark, when the lockdown happened, a lot of unknown happened. So CAMH did a study and they said one in four Canadians reported increased anxiety and one in five reported increased depression occasionally or most of the time. I'm going to move this here. Hold on one sec. There we go. Uh, most of the time. So not surprisingly, a survey with parents of parents with kids under the age of 18 living at home reported depression more than those without kids living at home. Not surprising, those without kids living at home still reported depression, but those with kids, a higher number. The biggest fears uh, that people had around COVID, 38%, their biggest fear was financial. 34%, the biggest fear was getting ill and fear of a loved one dying, 30%, that was their biggest fear. Next slide. So we know that COVID impacts women disproportionately. I know anyone who's joined this talk knows that already. Some of the reasons for that is generally women make less money than men, are able to save less, uh, have more insecure jobs, and then ge more generally live closer to the poverty line. There's been a reallocation of resources. Uh, when a pandemic happens, there's a certain number of resources, so they're reallocated, and services that affect women and children are, are one of the ones that are affected more disproportionately. We all know that women do a lot more of unpaid care work at home, but that had skyrocketed with COVID happening. Children out of school, the needs of adults, older adults in your lives, it's women that are taking the bulk of it. And unfortunately, but not surprisingly, we've seen an increase in gender-based violence. There's more social isolation, forced lockdown at home with abusers, supports disrupted, a longer time together has increased this. And then, not surprisingly, but disappointingly, women were not included in the decision-making process with COVID planning, not globally, not nationally, not provincially, um, but they are on the front lines of the, of the response. So women are teachers, women are nurses, women are PSWs, they're doctors. They are the main, they are the first people that, uh, that are responding that have to be out there, but are not involved in planning. So I have yet to hear a mother tell me that the plan of COVID testing was working. So early on, I don't know if you remember, you had to um, you had to just go line up at a COVID center. Any symptoms, you had to go line up. You could wait for hours. There was the drive-through, which was considered the best option because you could sit down and just take your time. But we had kids, you know, uh, families with two, you know, a two-year-old and a one-year-old in the car waiting for four hours in the car, no porta potty set up, no plans made. Um, parents had to get kids tested if they were lucky enough to get a test. They didn't know how long they had to wait for the results. They couldn't tell work, I'm coming back, I'm not coming back, I don't know what's happening. Um, not, not planned ideally. I always felt like if there was any mother on that planning board, not just a mother, but a mother who had children they were responsible for in real time. So not moms who have adult kids, but ones they're responsible for, the planning would have been very different like testing in schools or mobile units or local testing, all possible, but not done. Then they switched to online booking 
And again, didn't think through those slots would disappear quickly initially. So you would have a kid who had a cold, you needed a co probably just a cold, but we had to test for COVID. You'd wait to get a spot at 7 p.m. at night, 8 p.m. at night, you log on. And if all the spots were taken, you'd have to wait another two days until they released the new spots. Then you still didn't know how long the results were. So having women in the planning, leaving them out was a big mistake. Next slide, please. So the care economy was not addressed, was not addressed when resources were considered. So, uh, you know, when there was the CERB, you said, don't worry about it. Everyone's going to at least get a certain amount of money. It didn't, it was just the same amount for everybody. No, uh, no input on who's being affected more. And we know that women were being affected more. Formal economy jobs like PSW nurses, teachers are unpaid relative, underpaid relative to other sectors, less so in Canada than other places, but still relatively. At home, women perform the bulk of paid and invisible labor. This labor is essential though. That's the thing is that this labor that women do at home is necessary, not just for our home lives, but for the economy. We need to have people fed. We need to have people in school. We need to get them out the door to go to work. Um, this is, uh, and this is uh, premised on entrenched gender norms and inequalities. This existed before, but the pandemic really shone a light on it and differentiated the difference. Things are worse in the developing world where 70% of jobs are in the informal economy, earning a living wage required going to public spaces or interacting with others. We'd seen in outbreaks like Ebola that when pandemics or um, epidemics occurred, uh, men were quicker to return back to normal after the crisis. And we know women spend three times as many hours doing unpaid care than men, which limits their access to decent work, but also the about amount of time they can focus on their own work as well. Next slide. Am I frozen? Sorry, Dr. Tessimer, one second. Okay. If it's too, Can oh. Pause screen share for one second and bring it back up. I apologize. That's okay. I can I can carry on as well, but uh, you want to just give it a second because I have a, a printed out book copy. Oh, perfect. So I think it's just the next slide for. There we yeah. go. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Okay, so women's shelters and also child protection uh, services, pediatricians who work with children who are at risk, sounded alarms when they talked about the the lockdown early in March. This is not good for those people. So even though we were very afraid of um, of virus spreading, we were also afraid of the impacts it was gonna have on people who are at risk of abuse uh, at home, particularly women and children. And this did unfortunately bear out. Ontario shelters, women's shelters have reported increase in crisis calls during the pandemic. One in 10 women are reported being very or extremely worried about violence in their homes. That's a huge number, 10% of the women in our population. Reasons being jealousy, job loss, isolation, food insecurity, fears about the virus, mental health issues that are exacerbated, disrupting of routine services uh, and routines. And then quarantine itself means that abusers are in closer proximity for longer and others can't see the violence. So unfortunately this has increased during, uh, during COVID and this goes across all, um, all socioeconomic levels. Uh, violence against women at home is not just for other people. I, we see this a lot. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so women in the workforce. So interestingly, women at the front line of this pandemic, and the reason is that they are in the roles, often caregiving roles, really, um, healthcare and, and social assistant, 80% of that workforce is women, education, 69% is women, food services, 58% of women, all of those things not shut down uh, for COVID. So women are in all of these essential services. If they need to work, they have less likely chance of working from home. So it's harder to isolate. And when they do work, especially early on, if they were lucky enough to get PPE, PPE is created for men, which means that it doesn't fit women as well. It doesn't protect them as well. And it's harder to move, mobilize and it's more difficult. Uh, people talk about N95 masks early on. They were desperate to get N95 masks. In order, those were created for men in the hospital. 
when you get N95 masks, you have to get fitted every two years. Um, and it's a big process. Like you put the mask on, they put a hood on your head, they put this inert gas, you have to tell them if you taste it or not. If it doesn't work, then you have to try a different mask. So all of these things, but in general, tend to fit men more than women. So um, it, it's a setback. It's, it's definitely something that affects women disproportionately more. In Canada in March, a million people lost their jobs because of the lockdown. 63% were women. But by the end of July, more men than women had recovered their jobs. Single mothers are much more likely so than two parent families to experience job loss or reduction of hours, 38% versus 26%. So again, women disproportionately affected, single mothers even more so. Next slide. Okay, so, so COVID has intensified economic barriers that women have already faced. Uh, earlier in the pandemic, women a survey showed that women had higher burdens of worry. Men were less likely to follow public health advice. They were less likely to stay at home, less likely to social distance. Not great for virus transmission, better for their mental health. 75% of women feared the virus versus 64%. Women reported more feelings of anxiety or nervousness about the pandemic and more sleeping difficulty. Women reported more worry than men as they added on childcare and aging duties and lost jobs at a faster rate. So they were having already doing the childcare, doing the management of the home. On top of this, they're losing their jobs more um, and they're taking care of aging parents under unusual circumstances. Next slide. Thank you. So children, before COVID, 13% of kids aged four to seven had, I believe it's four to 17 actually, had significant mental, mental disorders, mental health disorders. Now parents are reporting um, needing much more support because of all the stressors that people feel. Now it's not just women that feel these stressors, men feel it, children feel it, everybody feels it. It just impacts women disproportionately because they're taking care of everybody else. But the supports are gone. All of those supports, respite, programming, family support, all of those supports are gone. And schooling, which is a huge support because children are out of the house for several hours and they get some supports, are uh, it's, it's switched to virtual and virtual is not enough, particularly for uh, children that have special mental health needs, which adds an extra stressor um, on the women at home taking care of them, on the mothers taking care of them. Next slide. So what do we see in family practice? So in my practice, which is at Prince Edward and Bloor, which is right across the street from All Saints, uh, right near Royal York and Bloor area, we still see people coming in. So families are coming in for routine visits and we hear the worries, but what they're coming in for is not for their worries. They're not calling because they're stressed. They're not calling because they're overwhelmed. They're coming because they have to for the babies. So when the babies are born, you usually see them every few days until they hit their birth weight. Um, as newborns. And then we see them at two months, four months, six months for their shots. And that has been continuing. So usually I'd say 90%, 95% of the time when they're that little, it's the mom that comes in with them. Uh, especially now with COVID, we try to have only one person to reduce uh, the number of people in the office. So it's most often the mom that comes. So they're coming in for a routine and we'll ask mom, how are you doing? And I cannot tell you the number of times people have just burst into tears because nobody asks or they don't have a safe space or they don't even have the opportunity to share and people are not doing well. So we've seen this before COVID. We've, we've definitely seen this before COVID, but much more during COVID. It is tough. It is really tough to manage everything. Women are reporting be, feeling stressed or overwhelmed or burnt out. They have anxiety and fear, which may, they may have had before or is new, but definitely amplified, depression and guilt. All the regular coping mechanisms are gone. Um, so the things that they used to do to treat, to deal with these, or at least reduce the burden of it, has have sort of instantly disappeared. Now they're slowly coming back, not as effectively as they were in the past though. So next slide. So the main stressors, this is what I'm hearing for stressors. They're worried, will finances be okay? Um, how will work respond to kids in the background and interrupting? It's very different for me to do a talk to the community and my kids jump in versus if you have a difficult work environment and kids are interrupting all the time. We also know that when parents, when kids interrupt moms, it's looked upon unfavorably. When kids interrupt dads, it's responded to very positively. People are worried about homeschooling. Who's going to do it? Am I going to be able to do it? Am I, are my children going to fall behind? They're worried about day-to-day -day things. Can I go to the grocery store safely? If you have two small kids and nobody at home to watch them, particularly because of restrictions, 
you have to bring them with you. Now they're touching things, they're touching their mouth. It's, it's a landmine uh, going through. So it's very stressful. Who's gonna visit grandma? Who's gonna visit mom? All those people that women are known to, women take care of generally, there's restrictions where they are, there's restrictions um, in terms of how often you can go, can you go, can you leave? So that, that's a very much a stress for women as well. Next slide. The anxiety and fear we're seeing. A lot of fear and anxiety I see for women in particular, mothers in particular, I should say, Will I get sick? If I get sick, their worry is not getting sick, it's the consequence of getting sick. Who will take care of the kids? Who will run the household? Who will manage? If my partner gets sick, that's an extra burden for the mom to take care of. Will someone at home get us sick? So uh, somebody who has to come in for a caregiver, for example, or will we infect somebody if the kids go to school when they were back at school, are we worried about affecting grandma? Uh, when schools were shut down and we didn't know about daycare, were we going to get a daycare spot? Is it going to be safe? Uh, what happens with viruses happening there? And a big concern is school and daycare safe? We want to send them for their mental health. You hear all sorts of messages in the media. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Should I go? Are you, you know, you hear about people creating pods uh, with a private teacher. Not everybody has the resources. Is that a better thing? A lot of unknown. Uh, so early, early on in the pandemic, patients called all the time asking, they were asking, should we go to, should we send this kids to school? Should we not send them to school? So we tried to put updates on our Instagram to kind of commit, connect with our patients about uh, what the recommendations are. But it was certainly a lot of unknown, particularly early on. Even now, we're not knowing, are we gonna, like the reports are, you know, on Friday, we're gonna make an announcement. Starting Monday, you can't go to school. That is not ideal for somebody who has to man manage a whole household. Um, it causes a lot of fear and anxiety. Next slide. Depression. Now we can see postpartum depression up to 30% of women. Um, and we are seeing increased numbers. Um, and it's hard, especially if you've never had depression or postpartum depression before, it's hard to identify the first time. And with less activity, um, it's hard to tell, is it the pandemic? Is it the baby blues? Is it postpartum depression? It's really hard to tell. So uh, we are seeing people suffering and it's definitely amplified because of COVID restrictions. And we're not having the supports to try one, identify it and two, to address it and support it. So we're definitely seeing more, more of that. Next slide. Guilt, this, this one is guilt. I, I see guilt all the time. Am I doing enough for my kids? Um, you get irritable or short with the kids or yelling at them. I think I've yelled three times at my children this morning already. So yelling at them. And then the guilt, why did I do that? They didn't do anything. Getting short with people to trying to help. Most often mother-in-law, but uh, <laughs> that's the peak that we see. But people trying to help out, giving unsolicited advice or, give, or helping out in a way that maybe is not helpful for you. And then getting short or uh, feeling bad because you have this support and resource and you're and it's not and you're angry about it or upset about it. Uh, another feeling of guilt is my kids are healthy or I'm on maternity leave. I'm not even working or we're financially stable. Why am I so angry or irritable or scared or short tempered? And then the guilt with that. So a common th thread in the practice is guilt, guilt over feeling what should what is a natural response. It's natural with this unknown to be irritable, to be scared, to be short tempered, that is natural. But the guilt is an extra layer that we see more on mothers than we see anywhere else. Next slide. So in family practice, under regular circumstances, pre pandemic, best case scenario, having newborns and small children is hard. I constantly tell patients, we are isolated compared to previous generations. It's not natural to raise a child with one person or two people in the family. Historically, you would have family members around, close neighbors, you, they would live in your home or down the street or across the street, people would support each other. You could have, you know, drop off your kid or, or go out and have feed the baby while you take a nap. That, so it's the way that we're living now is in a way very unnatural because we don't have those supports. But COVID has just amped up that um, isolation and all the mental health effects we see of that have just significantly increased. Supports like babysitters, mothers groups, music classes, exercise groups, all of those gone. Um, family can't visit. Normally you might have someone, a cousin come from out of town, pop in and out, that can't happen. And then sometimes you need someone to come and they're deemed an essential caregiver uh, and people feel very guilty. Like I brought my mom in, what if she gets sick, but I need her. A lot of guilt about that, even though it's an essential practice, even though it's essential need. Next, next, uh, pair, next slide. 
So recommendations, talk, 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 talk about it with your friends, with your family, whoever your people are, whether they're coworkers, friends, family, neighbor, talk about it. I promise you, it is very common. Behind my closed doors, people come in really happy, everything is fine, you ask and they burst into tears, it's because they're carrying a lot. Interestingly, everyone has different worries, so be sure to validate. So your biggest fear might be, what if I get sick and what happens to my family? Somebody else may not care about the virus, may not even be self-isolating, but they're worried about finances or they're worried about uh, violence at home. Um, all sorts of fears, uh, finances, development of children, worsening of, of, of mood disorders, if they're safe at home. So you're not alone. We're seeing this a lot. So please be, please try to reach out to people because I am certain when you reach out, the majority of people will understand and have their own struggles that they can share with you. Next slide. Getting outside. Um, natural light makes a big difference. The days are short, they're cold, it's hard to get out well, between work and homeschooling and just managing, but it is worth the effort, even if it's put on the coat boots and just step out the back door. Um, if you live in an apartment to be close to the window or to go down the stairs in a safe way or elevator to get natural light because it really does make a, mood, uh, a difference on your mood. Exercise, strongly advised, does not need to be fancy. So gyms are closed. Child care is down, but I'm going to give some uh, suggestions coming up about that. And then speak to a counselor. So if you've had depression, anxiety, stress, and you've spoken to a counselor in the past, it's a little bit easier to reach out. If you've never spoken to a counselor, it's harder. So let me tell you, you don't need to have a defined problem or know what to say. You just need to say, I'm not doing well. It's the counselor's job to talk, to, to help you tease out what's bothering you and how to address it. So don't feel overwhelmed or intimidated to reach out to a counselor. I wish we were all born with a counselor that was kind of like a guardian angel beside us and we could just reach out to them at any time. Um, historically, you know, your community would be a, a counselor, people you would talk to, but we're very isolated, especially with COVID. So reach out and ask. And I have some resources for that. And then see your doctor. Again, you don't need a good reason to see your doctor. So we're doing a lot of counseling and support when you come into the office for regular uh, visits for well baby. But you don't need, like moms don't need to have a reason to come in. They just need to call and tell us I'm not doing well. And we'll talk about it with you. Um, are they open? Probably. Uh, we hear a lot in the media family doctor's offices are closed, you can't get in. But statistically based on billing data, 96% of family doctors in Ontario have been open throughout the pandemic in some way. What we do at our office, what I know a lot of my colleagues do in other offices as well, some things are pre-booked. Uh, you don't need to talk to the doctor on the phone. So well baby visit, a prenatal visit, a pap test, those are pre-booked in advance. Um, anything else we do virtually, and that is we do like a video call or a phone call, the doctor decides if you need to be seen in person, if you need to be examined, um, or, or maybe just a discussion and the patient says, I really do need to be seen. And that is so we can spread out patients. We used to have four doctors in our office working at any one time. Now there's only one, maximum two. And that's how patients can go from the weight room. They come in, they go right into the exam room and that's for safety. Don't be afraid of safety. We know a lot more now than we did before. As long as you're wearing a mask and washing your hands and you're symptom free, come on in. Your doctor will be in PPE and we will be making sure you're um, separated from others. And then we'll bring you in if you need to be brought in after a virtual visit, we'll do it at a time where it's safe, where, the, where we can make sure that we space people out. Next slide. So here are some resources. Uh, Crisis Service Canada, that's the suicide helpline. You can call or text us 24 seven. Kids Help Phone, for those with older children, have that number available so that they can reach out themselves uh, if they want to, and you can even tell them about it. CAMH has an emergency number. Women's Habitat, uh, the numbers there and the, um, and the website is very good. It's, it's a shelter, like they have a shelter, but they have all sorts of other resources. They have counselors, they have social workers, they do support, like they have um, the financial support if you need diapers or um, if you need uh, formula or food, or um, if you need sort of emergency planning, like you don't want, you have a, a stressful or abusive situation at home, you don't wanna leave, but you just wanna be safe to be able to leave at any time, they will help you with that. Therapy, these are things that I've used before, but now they're like, like I probably say this like maybe five times a day. I, I email people with these reports. Telecbt.ca, this is newer since the pandemic. So it's family doctors who do um, therapy. They're trained in therapy, but it's done remotely through like a Zoom type of thing, a secure uh, thing. It's covered by OHIP, which is awesome. 
Ink blot therapy was something that existed pre a pandemic, so they were ahead of the time. They were doing virtual. It's not covered by OHIP, but it's very cost effective. It's like $40 to $50 a session. Um, and it's usually a social worker or a psychologist, often covered by third party. Um, third party uh, programs, insurance. And it's also very flexible. Like they have, because they have a ton of therapists, you can you know, do something at nine o'clock at night if you do shift work or you work all day. Um, so you can fit it around your schedule. Mind Beacon is an online, they assign a counselor to you and it's done online. It used to be costly, it used to be six or $700, but now it's covered by um, the Ontario government since the pandemic. So I encourage you to take uh, um, advantage of that. Uh, Karen Waddell is a local uh, woman who does mindfulness and she has a free, um, she has a free uh, session on, I think on Thursdays that she's been doing through COVID, um, for COVID time. Headspace is an app for mindfulness. Uh, Mood Gym is a cognitive behavioral therapy uh, program that's based from Australia. That's also a helpful resource, very cost effective. Next slide. Mm, let me switch over. Oh, here we go. Okay, so exercise. So remember, I said not to be fancy. Now, if you want to, you know, be a train for a marathon or for some competition, by all means, if that's your thing, that's awesome. That's great. But for most of us who have a hard time exercising, start low and go slow. Okay. The goal is not to break records, it's to circulate blood to your muscles, to get your joints moving, and to circulate blood to your brain, which is very good for neurotransmitters, for endorphins, for mental well being. So some of the ones that I like, MumNet, it's great for exercise, also for community. It's a nonprofit. They usually rent spaces in churches, but now it's uh, pivoted to virtual. Uh, it's one hour of exercise and then one hour of discussion. And there's usually a, a leader that talks about it, whatever the issue is. Mama Reset is a group, I believe they're physiotherapists who um, have a, a, a business that does uh, things like uh, exercise, diet, community. It's online and it's, uh, it's targeted for moms that have small children at home. Leslie Sanson, uh, this is a new one introduced to me uh, from my mother. Uh, my children tease me and call it the, the old lady workout, which is pretty much what it is. It's the old school low aerobics, uh, low impact aerobics. It's very easy, which is why I like it. There's only four steps every time, marching, standing, stepping side to side, bringing your knees up and kicking. Literally, those are the four steps. I like it because it's easy. You don't need equipment. You can do it at home. It's free. And there's 15, 30, and 45 minute versions. So if you can't do anything, you can say, I'm going to put in 15 minutes. Um, just Google it, Leslie Sanson homework, home workout, and you can do it. And then this I'm learning from the kids. If you Google any YouTube home workout, you'll find something for you. Pick a musician that you like, like my kids like Taylor Swift. So they do home workout, uh, Taylor Swift or um, 90s music, 80s, 70s, you can pick whatever you want and the time you want and you will find something for you. Centered Physiotherapy is a physiotherapist that does home visits that's pivoted online. She has some online home yoga for the family that's free. Um, and so I would recommend starting 15 minutes a day. So you are worth 15 minutes. So if I tell you your kids need to do 15 minutes or 30 minutes or one hour of doing this all day and you have to watch them, if it's for your child's well-being, you're going to do that for 15, one hour all day and watch them. But if I tell you you need to exercise for your well-being, that's on your lower list of priorities. But if you don't take care of yourself, no one is going to, you won't be able to take care of anybody. So that's how I try and push it. Um, say, take care of yourself to take care of others. It's the only way I can sell it to busy moms. But try to start low. So it's hard to fit in. You can't have, you don't have time to do anything. Fit it into your day. Start 15 minutes, put one of those videos on. If you can exercise outside, awesome. But if you don't have time, I encourage you to do one of these things. Um, and if you're into data, Twitter, Dr. Jennifer Kwan on Twitter, she puts out graphs of um, COVID uh, trends in Ontario, very easy to read, uh, tells you number of deaths, number of infections, um, and a seven day average. Uh, and if you wanna know what COVID is like in your neighborhood, the city of Toronto has an interactive map as well that tells you where the high number of cases are. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so I've had some questions. I'm gonna, um, Natanya or Brian, do you want me to start with these are the ones I got in advance or do you, are they clustered together based on what's in the chat? I think you can start with these, Dr. Tessimer. Okay, great. So um, screen time has picked up a lot because of COVID, is that okay? Yes, it's fine. Uh, we have to adapt to the environment. So um, we have to do what we have to do. 
Uh, when we talk about screen time and the recommendations, that's referring to passive screen time. So that's talking about watching movies, playing video games, just chatting. When it comes to schoolwork, the screen time on top of that is what we're trying to limit and with a grain of salt. So when I have uh, even before the pandemic, but especially now, if I had a mom that was sick, fever, cough, whatever, and I thought it's a virus, you need to rest, you know, antibiotics aren't going to help, you need to rest. It's hard to rest when you have a six month old and a two year old at home. So in that case, I always tell them, put them in front of the screen, whatever it takes for you to rest to get better. So the idea is they're not in front of the screen all day, every day from morning till evening, but don't feel guilty if you need some time in front of the screen. Um, and the Canadian, uh, Canadian and American Pediatric Society have changed. It used to be under the age of two, no screen time. They've changed it. So for FaceTime, for virtual, that doesn't count as screen time because it's interactive, because you're interacting with someone, even though it's a screen, which is very different than passive. Will pandemic isolation impact my child's development? We are seeing different types of development. We're seeing children that are figuring out ways to entertain themselves. They're figuring out ways to prepare their own meals. They're figuring out ways to, in the summer, they were figuring out ways, can I wear a mask and talk to my neighbor's kids? A lot more independence we're seeing. So where they're behind in something, they they're ahead in something else, they will catch up. And remember, all kids are affected. So I'm not very much concerned, except for kids with special needs or need special resources. I'm not as concerned about kids' development. And I, the, a very good question, I've had this a few times, any babies in the past year, have you noticed any difference this past year? I have not, we have not. We haven't seen any different. We see them all the time. Our, our practice is like a daycare because a lot of us do obstetrics. We see a lot of babies in the first year, despite not going to mom's groups or seeing grandma or going here and there all the time, baby's development is doing great. So you guys are doing an amazing job. Are there any other questions or resources that people would like to share? Dr. Tesmer, we've had a couple of questions come in in the Q&A box. Okay. And Natanya is just gonna facilitate those because I can't see with the screen share going. Okay, you can turn off the screen share at this point. Uh, okay. That's okay, yeah. There we go. Right. So the first question was about screen time, which you which you covered. Um, the specific question was, how much is too much? Um, the person asking the question says it's doubled, maybe tripled since the beginning of COVID, and I'm feeling guilty. Is this harmful to my child? There's the guilt again. No, not not harmful to your child. I can almost guarantee this is a first child parent. Uh, first child, we are very cognizant of how much time we spend in front of the screen. By the third child, we are like, go watch TV, go tell them that, right? So we have to compensate, you know, we have to compensate, but you're not affecting the child's screen time. Really, we're worried about people who are in front of the screen all the time and nothing else, right? And some days that may have to happen because you have a big project or the other kid needs you or something happens, but we don't want morning to night in front of the screen all the time, day in, day out. Okay, so that's the bigger thing to take home uh, message. So if you're having, and if you can have a grandparent help to even to read to them online, grandparents want to help, ask a grandparent to read to them. That doesn't count as screen time because they're talking to them, they're interacting with them. Thanks, Thank Dr. Tessimer. I had an email from a mom and she wanted to know, she said when her toddler is having behavioral challenges, how much can you attribute to COVID and COVID restrictions and how much to kind of normal toddler behavior? It is very hard to tell. Um, it is very hard to tell. Probably a little bit of both. You know, the terrible twos, and then what is the the trying threes? Um, it it's hard because they're acting out and you're acting out. So as a doctor, I will say, make sure you have boundaries. Be firm. Don't engage. Don't read in. You know, don't try to escalate when they're starting to act out. Don't act, don't. Um, Get, get involved into that to escalate it. You wanna be firm and disengage because really they're looking for attention, even negative attention is attention. As a mother, that is very hard to do, particularly when you're at your wit's end, right? You're managing your day to day, you're managing this and the older kid and then the toddler's acting out. It's very hard to hold your patience. So I would suggest forgiving yourself when you lose it, you will, okay? I once saw a parenting talk where she said, you know, she writes books on parenting. Um, it was the, I can't remember the name of it, the woman who does how to, uh, how to talk so kids will listen. Um, so, uh, and her mom was a behavior ther specialist as well. And she said she was doing something, she yelled at her child and then she felt bad. And then she goes, but don't worry, there will always be a time when the kids are gonna screw up and you can practice again, right? So it is not a one-time thing. You screw up, that's okay. They're gonna screw up. You have a chance to practice again and again. 
So um, if you're worried about toddler behavior, talk to their doctor because they'll be able to assess and um, assess how much of this is normal behavior and how much of it is stress from pandemic or stress from you know just being in that environment. I would also suggest bringing down your standards, bringing down your standards. I'll, I'll have you know that I especially showered for this presentation, brushed my hair. Um, even my children have noted going to clinic virtually, sometimes if I can fit in a workout, I'll work out in my workout clothes I'm doing, they're like, mom, come on, like pull it together. Um, bring, you have to bring your standards down, right? We gotta do the best that we can. And my patients have been really understanding. I started very politely with my virtual clinics, like, honey, I'm talking, I'm on the phone. Now I'm throwing things at them to leave me alone. Um, so bringing your standards down, um, and making sure that you're doing the minimum to take care of yourself. But if you're worried about children's development, call your doctors, they're there for you. Wonderful. We have a question. Um, somebody says, we used to leave our daughter with grandparents or babysitters so we could go out for dinner and special events. We haven't left our children with anyone since March. And now when we try to leave so we can have a break, they freak out. How can we manage separation anxiety in children? That's a, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, they will, it will happen. I don't know if it's worth putting that much investment right now, because, you know, when you did the daycare, you had to do um, like a, um, a staggered, you go for an hour and then two hours and a half day. I don't know if it's worth it uh, right now uh, because uh, you're going to be stuck together all the time. What I would recommend though, is if you do have a break or you have the opportunity for a break, the kids will be fine. They're resilient. So they're going to have a meltdown, leave them and go. Just find somebody who's not going to call you every three seconds because then you're not going to enjoy it. They're going to be stressed and you're not going to have had a break. Um, but if when things go back to normal, if they're still having separation anxiety, and I suspect that once they go back to school and once they get back into regular things, it will come back more naturally just based on their environment. Thanks, Dr. Tessimer. There's a question here. What about things like the HPV vaccine? and the shots kids got the first dose of in grade seven, they were due for the next dose and then COVID. Will this right. affect the eff efficacy of the vaccine, uh, the delayed second dose? No, it won't. So vaccines, when you give one, the booster has to be at a certain period of time. It can be later, but not earlier. So if you had the HPV vaccine and you got the booster two weeks later, that second one is not working that well. You'll have need a, a repeat. But if you got the first HPV dose, the second one, even if it's six months later, a year later, it's still gonna be fine because it's boosting what's already an uh, immune response in your body. Yeah, so I wouldn't really worry about that one at all for the HPV and hepatitis B. Uh, I'm much less concerned about it. I think like once they start to settle things down uh, and the public health clinics are back up or if they're doing them back at school, then I would do it at that time. That's not a high priority for me in terms of worry. Thank you. Uh, the next is a comment from uh, Reverend Jennifer Cameron, who's our deacon at All Saints Kingsway. Uh, and she says, as a retired public health nurse with the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program, I would like to emphasize the value of peer support. Public health offers groups for mothers suffering from postpartum depression, and these may be online now. Do you have any other uh, sort of things to say about the peer support piece? It's amazing. And that's where those groups like MomNet and Mama Reset, that's really communities. Uh, and it means a lot. So what's interesting, and I see a comment there that says, I, as an older mom, I call it the terrific twos. I love seeing babies in my office. I love it. And I always tell parents, are you going to have another one? Are you going to have another? Because it's not my problem, right? I see the cute part of it, the adorable part of it. Peer supports are amazing because you see someone in where you are now. Um, you see people where you are now. So you could have tons of friends, but their kids are much older. They don't have kids. It's very frustrating when you're um, at the point where you're at your wits end and you hear, oh, you know, this is the best time or, you know, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems, or the days are long, but the years are short. Enjoy it. It is very hard to enjoy it when you're struggling. And it is very nice to be with other people who understand your needs at that time. Doesn't mean those people are wrong, right? It is a beautiful time, but when you're struggling, you need support. In fact, we have a doctor's Facebook, like a mom's group, like a doctor mom group. Um, and and we, it's more like for personal things, but they're all doctors on it in Canada. And they created one of the group called um, a fourth trimester group, right? For Because you hear even amongst doctors, it'll get better, don't worry, but you don't wanna hear it at that time, right? You have different a different set of challenges. And when you're older, you have a different set of challenges. Um, so peer support is amazing. Um, and you really, once you start talking about it, you'll hear everybody has all sorts of different issues and also 
problem solving. You know what worked for me, this worked, this didn't work. Um, and it's, it's really a great thing. Dr. Tessimer, there's a question here from a mom of a high school student who has special needs. And she says uh, he's very tired of doing virtual school, finds it difficult to ask questions, curriculum is not adapted to virtual school, uh, frustrated or tired of sending emails to teachers and to special education advisor, worried about the difficulty and slow speed in, in doing assignments. Are there resources for her or for her son that you know of that she could reach out? So in terms of your, in terms of the frustration, she is not alone, particularly when there's special needs. Uh, and it's hit and miss, right? You have one teacher that really uh, reaches out and adapts and another one that doesn't. Uh, and they're coping with a whole different set of unknowns themselves, the teachers, right? So they're at their wit's end. Um, I would recommend, so doing what you're doing is advocating, which is amazing because a lot of people don't even have that bandwidth to advocate because they're working or they don't have the, the technical skills or the language skills. Continue with advocating, finding like type, like parents. So parents of kids with special needs community online. Um, you're just gonna need to search it and then ask your doctor as well to reach out because they can also write supportive letters saying, you know, based on this, this is what we recommend. They need less time off of screen or um, we need to have more of an adaptive environment. Uh, and, and, and the doctor can work with the uh, guidance counselor. And I 100% agree because I see different patients. I see like, one group where the school is really adapting and responsive and you know trying to help out with the kids with special needs or challenges another one the mom is an excellent advocate but there's no response at all and it's frustrating um and, and there's no standard there's nothing that's standard um so definitely finding your community reaching out to your doctor for sure wonderful friends i don't know if you have questions you're holding on to but if you want to take a moment and quickly put it in the q a box um, and we can also get questions to Dr. Tessimer later. If that's okay, Dr. Tessimer. And sure. We'll, we'll um, I also that. encourage if you have any uh, resources, if you have peer groups that you're part of that you like, or exercise programs that you like, um, counselors that you like, if you email Brian and maybe he can put those names up even anonymously or with advice, like uh, I learned so much from my patients, resources from my patients. They say, you know, have you tried this? And, you know, we like this. And they tell me. And then I added on my list of things to share with others because it really is community that makes a difference. So if anyone has any uh, programs that they like or groups or anything like that, I'd strongly encourage you to share that anonymously or openly. Um, so maybe you can post it under that video when you put it on the YouTube channel. Yeah, that would be great. There's just a comment here from my mom. She says, I'm a much older mom and I always called it the terrific twos. <laughs> and they are terrific twos, but not when you're in the... Not when you're in the throes of it, for sure. And then some kids are terrific too, and they're more challenging teenagers. And some kids are very challenging younger kids and easygoing teenagers. Everybody has a different experience and they're all valid experiences. Indeed, I concur. <laughs> Wonderful, Dr. Tessimer, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise, for just letting us know what you're hearing. Did one more question come in? Yeah. Wonderful, sorry, I just saw the number go up there. One yeah. more, Dr. Tessimer. So we, we have suspect, a question. Oh, go ahead, Brian. If we suspect a friend or a relative is suffering from postpartum depression, what do we do? Reach out to them, tell them, normalize it. I think the biggest thing is the um, internalizing of it. People feel, women feel guilty. Either they're not aware of it and they've just uh, um, sort of uh, um, separated themselves from it, or they are internalizing, not that I feel depression, but why don't I feel connected to my child? Why do I, I regret having a child and then feel guilty about that feeling? Normalize it. So reach out and tell them, I notice that are things okay? I'm here for you. So I'm here for you if you need anything. You can even say, you know what? I just went to this talk. I heard about it. It's really common. They're seeing more of it. Um, if you want to know more, let me know. I'm here for you. If there's anything I can do, um, because often people are with, with depression are really, they, they start to go inside themselves. Uh, there you go, you can see them in the background. <laughs> um, so uh, they're often, you know, internalizing. So just be there to support. What can I do? Um, sometimes it's as, you know, you could just even, you know, send a meal. I've just decided to send a dinner. If you know that they like a certain dinner, I've sent this dinner for you just because I think you need a break. You deserve a break. I wish I could be there to hold the baby and give you a break. 
or I saw this talk, or I heard about this awesome thing, and then just check in periodically, just check in and offer to be there, to be a voice. Thank you, Dr. Tesmer. That's great. Just a reminder, we're going to get this recording up on our YouTube channel, and we will send you the link um, by email. And uh, Dr. Tesmer, really, really grateful. Thank you for being here today. Thank we you for having it. me, and thank you for organizing. I think it's a great idea. Our community is really overlap or we share a community and being able to uh, reach out like this is, is a great idea. So I encourage anyone that would be of interest uh, in the addictions, if they know someone suffering from addictions or feeling addictions, uh, you can come in anonymously or openly. Um, and then the caregiver for people with dementia also very trying to spread the word. Indeed. All right. I'm just going to put up a quick poll and uh, ask you to give us some feedback. There are three simple questions. You should see them up on your screen. Let us know what you think. We appreciate your feedback. When you've given us that feedback, you can feel free to sign off and we hope to see you on uh, one of the next Kingsway talks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Take Dr. Care. Customer. Bye-bye. Everyone. Thanks, Natanya.